Welcome to the External Medicine Podcast. We are here with Dr. Ross Levine of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Levine studies hematologic malignancies and is a world-renowned expert on myeloproliferative neoplasms and acute myeloid leukemia. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different than other episodes that we've done in the past. We're going to do a deep dive into acute myeloid leukemia. So buckle up. And Ross, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Before we get started, do you have any financial disclosures? Yeah. And if you go to my Twitter handle, I've got a little um, Google link that lists all my disclosures. I I am on the board of directors of a company called Kyogen, which makes um, diagnostic assays. And I founded a couple companies called Ajax and Oron that are in the sort of malproliferative AML space, nothing that's on the market. And I've advised a whole bunch of um, companies on how to develop AML drugs, um, none of which I don't think we'll talk about today. But again, if you want to look up my disclosures, they're all uh, if you go right to Ross Levine MD on Twitter, I've got a clear disclosure and uh, I do what I do and uh, people should understand, you know, the interactions we all have trying to make medicines and how that impacts what we do and uh, be transparent about it. Excellent. So can you tell us a little bit more about your background and specifically yeah. how you got interested in oncology and um hematologic malignancies. Yeah. So I, uh, I'm i an MD. Um, I went to uh, med school at Hopkins. And um, at that point, I actually ended up in a lab for a summer just kind of to try science and got hooked and ended up doing a, a year of research in medical school, which was focused on gynecologic cancers. And that sort of got me interested in oncology and sort of this idea that it was this area where science and medicine were really you know, intertwined and exciting and the molecular genetics and all that. And then I went to residency at Mass General and I realized during residency that cancer was an area I wanted to maybe do, but I also felt that I wanted to be in the part of oncology where I thought, one, there was a lot going on, acuity was high. I kind of liked ICU and sort of sick patients in the hospital. And the other was that, you know, I wanted to be in an area where medical therapy, because I was going into medicine, had the ability to cure, uh, you know, at least some of the patients. And so leukemia kind of ticked all the boxes for me. And as I started my first year fellowship, I really, um, it was the idea that there were these super sick, complicated um, patients and that you really could, you know, pitch in and and do your best and in the best of cases, get really good outcomes. But there was still, you know, a lot of patients who weren't cured of their disease. And that really was sort of, I felt like I really enjoyed being a doctor for leukemia patients, but I also wanted to be in the lab to study the science to see if we could do even better. So maybe before we dive into AML, could you give us an overview of some of the other leukemias that are out there and the major differences between them? Yeah. I mean, the way I I like to think of it, and I think most of us who take care of leukemia think about it, is that you kind of break everything into acute um, and uh, chronic, um, you know, and um, we think of, you know, the chronic myeloproliferative disorders and MDS and CLL, uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And then in the acute side, you really have ALL, acute lymphocytic leukemia and AML. Um, and so, you know, I think of the chronic diseases, as there's often chronic myeloid and lymphoid. They're their own entities, their own experts, um, you know, myeloproliferative neoplasms are an area I've thought a lot about. But in the hospital, when patients kind of walk in, almost all of them have an acute leukemia, um, at least if they've newly diagnosed and they're coming in for the disease. And in adults, it's almost, you know, overwhelmingly AML. And in children, it's overwhelmingly ALL. And yet we as adult leukemia docs treat and diagnose both and vice versa in kids. So what is the typical patient who gets AML and how does AML present? Well, you know, what's interesting about AML is that if you look at sort of on average, it's a disease of the aging population. The median age in the United States is 68. Um, And um, I think we often have this conception that AML is a disease where like most leukemias that young people get um, and that we treat them and, you know, hope for the best and see how things work out. But many patients are older. As you might imagine, at referral centers and academic centers, we definitely do, though, see quite a number of younger patients because they'll seek out um, therapy. Uh, uh, Also, many older patients, if they're seen in community hospitals, often they're told there's not a lot to do for them, and that's a whole separate conversation. Um, And most AML patients come in 
because one or more of their um, blood lineage lines are suppressed. So they have low hemoglobin and hematocrit. So they have the symptoms of anemia. It can be sort of acute on chronic, so short of breath, fatigue, you know, um, heart failure or ischemic if they have heart problems. Um, if they have low platelets, they often will bleed and ooze. A classic symptom is they have a dental procedure and they don't sort of stop bleeding or oozing after the procedure, suggested that they're having problems with secondary sort of control of bleeding, um, nosebleeds, um, hemarthrosis, or a traumatic injury that swells and bleeds and doesn't get better. And then, you know, with patients' white count, it can be high or low, and either way, they have a reduction in sort of the effective um, blood cells. In particular, the neutrophils are altered. And so those patients will often present with classical sort of bacterial infections. They don't get wacky infections. It's very different than a patient with ALL who has defective T and B cell function or a patient after therapy for AML. So what usually what they get are sort of classical, what we call sort of gram positive infections, you know, get purulent you know, URI, fever, whatnot. You don't see a lot of gram-negative sepsis or fungal disease in an untreated AML patient, but they will after treatment and they have a prolonged mater, they're at risk for those things. So as I, as, as I always say that the job at the front lines when you see these patients is to say, why are they here? And what could potentially be life-threatening in the first 24 to 36 hours while we work them up and figure out what we're gonna do more definitively? In terms of the workup of AML, um, we're talking about it as though it's one distinct entity. How do you think about the different types of AML? Well, I think, you know, when patients roll in the door, you know, you're largely thinking not yet about what subtype they'll have. The only exception would be a, a rare subtype called acute promyelocytic leukemia, where, you know, the rapid um, use of retinoids as part of therapy can really improve survival and they can get DIC and be very sick with sort of thrombosis. So there is this sort of um, need to consider um, APL out of the gate. And if there's any concern and they have a characteristic, you know, often pancytopenic, um, they have characteristic flow characteristics in somebody on a, on a, even on a CBC machine can see they look kind of different. Um, and we can run a PCR for PMLIR. But in the first 24 to 36 hours, yes, there's a whole bunch of AML subtypes that we obs we AML docs obsess about, where when we think about treatment initially and subsequent, we need to separate it. But sort of in those first 24 to 48 hours, it's either it's AML and how I keep alive and should I be considering in this person acute, acute promyelocytic leukemia. So I want to get to what we do for these patients currently, but maybe before we get there, can you can you walk us through what we used to do? You know, when when AML was first discovered as a separate disease, what did we start using then? And kind of walk us through the the timeline. I, I recognize this is sort of a long question, but you know, walk us through like how how things changed over time. Yeah, I mean, I think you know if you look at the history of AML and if I don't know if you guys or any of your podcast listeners have read The Emperor of All Maladies, Sid Mukherjee's book, you know, because that really mostly tells the story of ALL, which was the first disease cured by um, modern um, chemotherapy. Um, you know, and the story there was that they learned that the must, that Mustard's aminopterin was effective. And then in the 60s, um, you know, multi-agent chemotherapy initially at MCI with Fry and Freireich, and then many institutions, St. Jude, Roswell Park, MSK, Dana Farber, you know, multi-agent chemotherapy. And so that was the first great success story. And it, AML was kind of in the in the sort of shoot after that. You know, you had testicular lymphoma at and both Hodgkin's and AML. And I think initially it was mostly like, huh, do the same drugs work in AML as we do in AML? And how do we come up with a cocktail? And in the 70s, what we learned was that you can give, you know, different types of chemotherapy, they'd work, and you could sort of combine them. And, and, and it was really landed on this combination of an anthracycline like um, donorubicin and cytarabine as being the most effective regimens. And people played around empirically with the regimen that led us to sort of induction chemotherapy. And really, ultimately, you know, in the 70s, we treated patients. Most of them still died of their disease. Very few of them were cured. But there were sort of two major um, innovations in the late 70s, early 80s that turned the tide. The first, which I think is not really talked about enough, 
is the better um, empiric use of anti-infectives. If you look in when people with AML started to live, it was when we began empirically treating patients with AML with febrile neutropenia for gram-negative sepsis, and then figuring out when to use antifungal coverage with persistent neutropenic fever. And that was probably in the late 70s, starting at NCI, the first thing, because it was getting them through these infections. Because when the time patients had gram-negative bacteremia, often the sort of dye was cast. And that's very different than gram-positive infections, where you can treat um, when you have a presumptive culture, right? So that was number one. And then the second was that real use, what we call consolidation therapy, because we give chemical therapy for AML, we can get a remission in some people, but then it would come back. And so it was this idea that we had to give people therapy, you know, then for the next four to six months it, to debulk them to a true disease negative state and figuring out, you know, ultimately how to do that and what regimens to use that led to sort of, you know, that was the backbone of the first curative strategy for AML. Figure out how to handle the infection to give enough chemotherapy induction of the, and then these follow-up consolidations so that you could really um, improve outcomes for patients. Forgive my total ignorance of this in terms of induction therapy and consolidation therapy. Yeah. Like, what are the time frames like for that for a course for uh, like a yeah? So the, the induction therapy regimen that became the standard of care is what we classically call seven plus um, three. So what that is is three days of um, an anthracycline, usually um, domorubicin, given on days one, two, and three, and then seven days of cytarabine or RSC. And usually that seven days, then patients have a two to four week sort of counts plummet and then see what happens after four to five weeks. And then you see if the normal cells come back and the leukemias don't. And that's sort of standard. If after two to three weeks, you're not getting enough of a response and the person's doing okay, you'll give them what's called a reinduction or chaser of what we call five and two. So the same drugs, but two days and five instead of three and seven. And then... Once people are okay and their accounts recover, we don't see leukemia in the blood, we repeat a bone marrow. And if we don't see 5% blasts or more, we declare them with normal counts in complete remission. And then what we'll do is we'll actually bring them back for a consolidation where every four to six weeks, we'll give them a round of five days of cytoharabine treatment. We use now high dose ARC as the regimen. I can talk about why and how that was chosen. And basically you do that for three to four cycles. And the idea being that for patients that can be cured by chemotherapy, which is only a subset, that really does you know, eradicate um, in many patients their leukemia. How did we decide on the seven plus three and the five plus two? I honestly think that that was mostly based on what in the 70s people found that you could tolerate because what happened is they were throwing those drugs at patients and they worked. And then people started playing around. I, If you really look back, I'm not aware that there were trials that tried like seven and three versus five and two or whatnot. I think most of the early trials, that seemed to be about as much as people could take without sort of dying, right? It was sort of the, it, it was the right two drugs and that was the right concoction. But I don't think it, there were a lot of randomized trials uh, on that. What there were after that were a number of randomized trials in the 80s and 90s where that was the standard and a lot of things baked off against it. And there's a long history of like idorubicin versus donorubicin. There was adding a toposide, so what we call ADE versus seven and three. People added clofarabine. And the short answer is none of those trials, despite in some cases encouraging phase two data, none of those trials in a phase three um, trial beat seven and three. So it, it really became the standard. Things did change ultimately because there was a trial called the ECOG 1900 trial in younger adults, where they doubled the dose of donorubicin from 45 per meter squared to 90 at dose intense, seven and three. And in younger adults, but not older adults, that actually improves overall survival. There were some post-hoc analyses about what subsets, but most of us would argue in young people where you're treating with chemo with current intent, you need to give higher dose donorubicin. There are critiques of that, those, that trial. The main critique being that they baked off 45 and 90, and a lot of people thought that there's a dose in between like 60 or 80 that's better. And I think nobody can argue, what we know is that 45 is not enough, and you got to give at least 60. 
And you'll, you go to different institutions, you'll see, like we tend to use the 90 and younger adults, but some people will use 60. I think that's totally reasonable. And so that's the most important thing. What has been shown subsequent is that for the 40% of AML that have a mutation in a gene called FLT3, which is the most common acquired mutation and portends a bad prognosis, that if you add a drug called metastorin to the 7 and 3 and do 7 and 3 plus a FLT3 inhibitor, that actually in a randomized trial had a overall survival of 59 versus 52%. Um, and so we do add for that subset of patients a small molecule inhibitor, which is continued throughout their course. The other thing which we didn't talk about is in consolidation is that things were tried, like seven and three again, cytarabine. And what ultimately happened was in the um, CLGB study was that um, high-dose RC, which is three grams per meter squared twice a day on days one, three, and five, was better than lower-dose RC or even combining. And so what you're basically doing is while whomping them with cytarabine, and you're just cleaning up the residual leukemia cells. And so that's sort of the, that's what chemotherapy is for AML. These two drugs up front, and then the one drug after, and then everything else we do is now asking, all right, are there alternatives to that for patients who can't tolerate or should get something else? And then the use of stem cell transplantation, you know, what do we do, you know, for how do you bring transplant into the equation? Yeah, we'll get to transplant in a second, but I want to talk uh, just briefly. You mentioned FLT3. I want to just talk about the different genetic and epigenetic subgroups within AML patients. How do you stratify who gets yeah. what? Yeah. It's a great question. What I would say is that, you know, we we started in the um, 90s by and early 2000s by knowing that there were about eight or nine recurrently mutated genes in AML. And people began sequencing them and asking which ones of them not only are indicative of a subtype, but ultimately have um, predictive value um, in AML. And what we learned was that you could segregate AML based on mutations and chromosomal alterations into these three subsets. There is what we call core binding factor. So it's either an 821 or an inversion 16. Um, those patients are chemosensitive. And if you give them um, induction plus chemo, they have a 50% or greater, maybe 60% chance of surviving and cure. So they really have chemosensitive disease. And then you have the people that have adverse chromosomal alterations, like minus five, minus seven, three or more. Most of those people now we know have P53 mutant disease. Those patients are never cured with chemotherapy. And so we'll talk about transplant. But and then in the middle group, which is either normal karyotype or intermediate risk, most of them are normal karyotype. There also are some abnormalities that don't sort either way. In that group, that's where mutations really started to declassify and where you can show, for example, that having a um, FLT3 mutation, but in the, you know, has bad prognostic value in that subset, having a CABP alpha mutation has favorable, and having an NPM1 mutation is favorable as long as it's not also FLT3, and then that's negative. And so we sort of segregated that. And the reason I bring up the transplant thing was that the studies that showed outcome also showed that if you then layer transplant on top of those subsets, the, the, the good risk patients Chemo is good enough. Transplant, all it adds is toxicity. The bad risk patients have a 15 or 20% chance of a good outcome with transplant and very little chance with chemotherapy. And then if you use those mutations in the middle group, you can start to segregate out that the FLT3s benefit from transplant, the CBP alphas, which do well, don't, the MPM1s with and without FLT3. And so that really you know, changed how we think about it. And that was kind of where we've been for the last 15 or 20 years. And then ultimately now you, you can sequence a hundred genes and be much more refined. And there are really great calculators where you can now actually look and give a patient and say, this is your likelihood of benefit um, with chemo only, with chemo followed by transplant. These were studies done all in Europe because in those studies, they had patients based on whether they had an HLA match. They either got a transplant if they had a match or they only got chemo if they didn't. It's called genetic randomization. And so we've got a lot of good data now where for chemo and or transplant, you can use these genetic profiles plus all the other features that a patient can plug in their white count. And you can look with a patient and say, this is what transplant does for you and talk to them and make a thoughtful sort of collaborative decision about whether stem cell transplantation makes sense. 
Let's talk a little bit more in detail about transplants. Um, so you have patients that are either low, intermediate, or, or high risk AML. What are the different types of transplants? And like for a patient that's actually going to be going through this process, like what are the actual steps for them to get a transplant? Yeah, I mean, what I would say is that the gold standard for transplants would be an HLA matched, either related or unrelated donor. Always remember that your sibling has a one in four chance of matching to your HLA alleles. And for Caucasians, there's a high probability that you can find an HLA uh, match an unrelated for other ethnicities, not so much. And we desperately need greater diversity in our donor banks. And so the reason I bring that up is that although we can talk about alternate strategies like haplos and match, un, you know, mismatched transplants, all the studies that compared transplant versus not that I just talked about only let people with an HLA match go. And so if you want to be rigorous, you'd say the gold standards in HLA match transplant, some of the studies will add yeah, to be related, some are unmatched, related or unrelated. But we've innovated a lot. You could now do cord blood um, in subsets of people that don't have options. There are now haplo um, transplants that use conditioning. But the way we think about it is that we tend to use those in bad risk patients who don't have an HLA match. But you're not going to like use these more you know, innovative transplantation strategies to extend the use of transplant to other, you know, transplant folks we wouldn't. It's just for the people where we can't find a match. And then you were asking, you know, it's a, the biggest challenge with transplant is that it's a big, long process, right? You got to like get the patient in good physical condition. It's, it's a big, you know, um, challenge for them. You have to get the donor ready, whether they're related or unrelated. They go through this battery of tests to make sure that their lung and liver and kidney function are okay because the conditioning and transplant, and there are intensities. You can do a full pull, fully ablative transplant or not, but either way, you know, the risks of lung and, and kidney um, and, and, and liver damage from the treatment or from graft versus host disease is substantive, and many patients have graft versus host disease after. And so you really need people to be in good condition, and you need their leukemia to be either in remission or near remission. And if either one of those two things isn't true, sometimes you know it's this hourglass thing where the patient is a transplant eligible, and then you got to say to yourself, can I keep this person in good enough leukemia-free state and physically fit enough? To, while getting this all orchestrated, which can take four to eight weeks. And there's definitely, a, you know, not everyone who you want to transplant will actually get there. So how do we decide who gets chemo versus who gets transplant in chemo versus the other options? Well, I think the way we do it now more and more is with those risk calculators. We sort of look and we say, okay, what's the benefit in this patient with their genetic sort of profile and their clinical parameters. Uh, what's our likelihood of cure with chemotherapy? And I don't even try and like look at it and get people, I actually plug in the numbers right in front of the patient. I go, these are your, this is what the largest data sets, the caveat is that it's a German, largely Caucasian group. And there are limitations to sort of that, but I say, this is the data. And that those, that try, that the, those calculators um, have data with and without transplant. And I sort of lay out for the person, remembering that in, most of those trials, it was chemo alone or chemo followed by transplant. One of the challenges we don't know is how much chemo to give before transplant, because no one's ever like randomized people to like, well, there's some more recent data suggesting that maybe you don't need as much chemo if you're going to go to transplant. But the answer, honestly, is that we make the decision pragmatically. We give chemo just to keep the person in remission until the transplant is like in the shoot. Do you know what I'm saying? Because what we don't want to do is have someone relapse because we didn't treat them. And then like, I write as we're doing the transfer of the leukemia roars back. So there's like a timing thing. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about grass, uh, graft versus host disease and graft versus leukemia? What, you know, sort of that balancing act of, yeah. yeah. So like when in the early days of transplant, before we had great um, anti-rejection drugs, the transplants were largely done from identical twins who are genetic matches. And what we learned was two things. The first was that people tolerate those transplants beautifully, but their leukemias basically invariably come back. And that's because the graft or the donor T cells recognize the leukemia as identical. So there's complete tolerance. And so what we've learned is that even if the HLA are matched, 
there are many different immunological sort of um, uh, differences between the donor and the recipient and that they'll recognize the recipient as foreign. So what that means is that the donor T cells both um, recognize the leukemia as foreign and will attack it. That's graft versus leukemia. But then they can recognize host tissues, in particular um, liver and GI tract and, and skin, um, and that's graft versus host disease. And by and large, the two tend to track together, meaning if you engineer enough of a mismatch, and in fact, like a HLA mismatch transplant has the highest risk of graft versus disease, but also the lowest risk of leukemia relapse. And so there's an R to figuring out what to do. The general rule of thumb is that if we see an HLA match, we do it because like, you know, it does reduce the risk of graft versus disease and they're still mismatched enough. The second is we've gotten really good at managing and improving the drugs to to either prevent or ameliorate if it occurs, graft versus host disease. So we don't like want to like condemn people to horribly mismatched transplants where the GVH is awful because we think we more and more can treat it. The holy grail for transplant is can you separate out the GVH and the graft versus leukemia? I would argue that that remains um, aspirational and scientifically interesting, but clinically not yet fully attainable. In terms of risks for transplants, besides grass versus, I'm saying the same thing as my brother, to graft versus host disease, um, what are the other infection risks and biggest causes of mortality in patients? And what are some of the treatment options besides for transplant? transplant? The right. challenge with transplant is it's essentially an immunological reset, right? So like all the like T cell immunity you had your whole life kind of is gone and you kind of restart. And so basically in the first hundred days after a transplant, they're at risk for like everything. They get everything from wacky infections, the opportunistic infections, like we see, used to see it. You know, we don't see fortunately that much in the developed world for end stage HIV Capacity sarcoma, um, pneumocystis, all these other diseases, they get all the normal gram positive, gram negative, and fungal infections, which can be devastating. They can get um, vac like the things you vaccinate against, and that's why we keep them the hell away from people that have all these communicable diseases, and you want to keep them around vaccinated people. And then as time goes on and they recover their immune system, they actually get revaccinated against the vaccine, and then you know, they ultimately develop, you know, some cell and um, uh, innate immunity, um, probably takes a year or two or three for them to get back to their new steady state. And are they ever fully back to normal? I think that's a, that's a long and interesting question. Is their immune system and repertoire truly ever back to normal? I think that's not known. Okay, let's, let's talk I was going to say the biggest challenge is that graft versus host disease when you get it can be awful, you know, horrible rashes, GI tract. So it really, you know, I, I don't want to be glib, but I think there are many people that have horrible GBH that say, if I'd known how bad this was, you know, I don't know, you know what I'm saying? It really is, can be horribly um, debilitating. And so you have to be incredibly respectful, thoughtful, and aggressive in treating GBHD when it starts to occur. What's the counseling like for GVH beforehand, given how terrible it can be for certain people? Well, I think, you know, transplant, you know, is like bone marrow transplant, like solid organ transplant. You know, there's a huge amount of pre-procedure counseling, psychological evaluations. You really do want to understand that people understand sort of the long haul they're getting into. And as someone who's a leukemia doc and mostly takes care of people and gives chemotherapy, it's a totally different ball of wax, right? Because like, you know, we look at a patient with leukemia, I can give them a really clear articulation that it might be a month of hell. But if you get through that, you know, and your leukemia is gone, I feel like we get to the next step. Transplants are much, you know, you know, it's, you know, and, and you look at, I have, I have patients and people I know that had um, transplants in the COVID era. These people became shut-ins for two, three years, right? And so like, you have to think very long and hard about and talking to people very frankly about all that. And they need to understand it. And they need a caregiver. Like if someone has nobody in their life, it's really hard to get through a transplant. It's they're incredibly sick. They have a million appointments. They're in a day hospital, they have a million meds. So that's the other part that's really hard to manage. Let's talk a little bit about relapse. So you you do the chemo, maybe you do a transplant, maybe you don't. 
who who relapses? How often do you check? What are you looking for? And what are the options at that point when someone, if someone does relapse? Well, transplant or not, I would say that we, you know, check, you know, blood counts every three months for at least a couple of years. And people usually will do a bone marrow every six months. Um, we don't actually know that that is definitive, that you need to do that, or if you should just wait. Um, but we definitely would rather know early versus late. Um, in the non-transplant setting, that's all we got. There are molecular tests, the following mutations too are beginning to be um, employed that we're really excited so we can find relapse early and we're doing that. In the transplant setting, you have the benefit because the donor and the recipient have different genetics that you can also just track whether the person you know, remains a fully donor. And often the first time things are in trouble is when you start to see the host blood system come back, you know, you, and even before it's overtly leukemic. And that what that suggests is that the donor is no longer able to res restrain or attack, you know what I'm saying? And that can often be a heartbringer. And so I will tell you that, you know, we worry greatly about relapse. It's really daunting when relapse occurs. And it's really daunting if it occurs early. I think our biggest concern especially in the transplant setting and even the non-transplant setting is when it comes back fast. Um, it, we, you know, in the first six to 12 months, because th what that usually means is that people are not fully recovered from the treatment they got. It may limit what you can do for them. And it means their leukemia is probably pretty bad leukemia. Whereas a person who relapses three years out and they're like, you know, often kids almost aggressively retreat them. And in the transplant setting, you do have the option if someone's doing well otherwise to actually give them more donor lymphocytes or T cells from their donor if the donor is available. And, you know, you, but if someone's got horrible GBH, it can precipitate worse GBH. So there's an art to that too. What are some of the uh, big open questions currently in the uh, realm of leukemia treatment? Well, the big what? thing, the big thing is that we now have lots more drugs. You know, we have um, the big one really was the use of venetoclax, the BCL2 antagonist with azacitidine in older adults, which is incredibly effective and somewhat better tolerated than chemotherapy. There's never been a randomized trial yet comparing it to aggressive chemo. It's mostly been tested in randomized trials versus lower intensity chemo in older adults, but it's really effective. The negative of it is that we don't know if it's curative or if it just gets you in a long-term remission, unlike chemo. But I think a lot of what we're struggling with right now in the field is when you bring out that is the big ends of chemo, there are some randomized trials that are ongoing right now that are going to be critical because reading out like whether we can identify subsets of one or the other. In the relapse setting, there's a lot of drugs that are um, out there and coming. You know, the FLIP3 inhibitors um, are useful in patients relapse, so you don't always have to give them chemotherapy. There are drugs against the IDH1 and IDH2 mutations, um, and there are drugs that are coming down the pike, for example, that targeted a protein called menin for NPM1 and MLL rearranged patients. So we actually have a greater and greater um, set of targeted therapies. Most of those are used in the relapse refractory setting, but the FLIP3 has moved up front with chemo and the IDH inhibitor, if you combine it with azacitidine, is another upfront option. So I think what's interesting is that it's getting more complicated, but we don't yet have enough comparative data to figure out, you know, we know they're all good options, but we don't know often in which patient, which is the best. So you mostly present them to patients. You give your gestalt of what you think. And you also talk to them about the side effect profiles and what it would be like, and really let them decide with you collaboratively what's best for them. We might have breezed over it, but can we just give a brief uh, overview of the the bifurcation at seven plus three versus A's of N for who gets what and uh, and why? So the answer is that in older adults, um, the approval for Venaza was based on a trial where patients who were not deemed to be candidates for intensive therapy were randomized to Aza Ven versus doctor's choice. And in that scenario, Aza Ven won. And that has led people to argue that Aza Ven should be a, a really thoughtful option for all older adults with AML. The problem is nobody baked it off against intensive chemo. So I don't think there's a elegant or you know evidence-based answer to your question but there what we're seeing is that there's use of either option depending on the 
investigator, the patient, the scenario. And the problem I have is that in general, it's not like A's of N works in one subset and chemo works in the other. They tend both to work best in the groups that have the best, most sensitive disease. And in the higher risk disease, they both have some efficacy, but neither one of them like is curative. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Changing gears just slightly, uh, you run a laboratory. What sorts of research questions are you currently asking? I mean, our long-term interest is in doing, um, you know, genetic or genomic analysis of leukemia patients and understanding in every patient the mutational repertoire, initially in bulk and now even in individual cells, and understanding how leukemias develop in different patients. And then we go back to the lab and we make um, mouse models that recreate those same genetic events and ask, do you get leukemia? And if so, can you begin to unravel the sort of molecular mechanisms that drive those leukemias. And we also test drugs in those models. So we develop models and then test these different therapies we're talking about and see if we can test even, for example, adding new drugs to chemo or venaza in models and randomized trials in, in mice that might help us nominate, which, you know, and, and accelerate the more promising uh, therapeutic regimens. What do you think the future of AML treatment looks like? I think that's a great one. I'm hopeful that in the next two to three years, we're going to know if there are sweet spots for venaza versus chemo. And I think that's the first like thing that has to fall. I think the second is we need to know if all these molecularly targeted drugs like the FLT3, IDH, and Menin, should we be adding them to every patient, whether they get venaza or chemo, and add the targeted drug? And like, do we have enough like evidence-based that that makes a difference or should we save them for relapse? You know, people will argue it's not just compa comparing them to the upfront, it's comparing adding everything upfront versus adding chemo and then using those drugs if people fail, right? It's the strategy that you wanna. So again, I think a lot of that data is gonna come down the pike. My long-term hope is that we'll have a lot more new drugs. I hope we have more molecularly targeted genetic and epigenetic agents. I'd love to see more strategies like cellular and bites targeting aberrant cell surface molecules. There's a lot of that playing out, but all of that is still in very early preclinical to clinical development. I've heard that there's more frequent use of randomized control trials in pediatric cancer populations where they're more likely to get randomized. And that's why the regimens that they use have more of an evidence base behind them compared to adult patients. Is that true? And if so, why do you think that is? I don't know if that's true. I would say that um, in leukemias, the reason ultimately that ALL treatment um, got so good in, in, in children was based on two fundamental things. The first is that almost every kid in the US is treated on a trial, whether it's randomized or not. Like, I think that for many years, you know, the COG, St. Jude, Dana-Farber, Sloan Kettering, they had trials that were open at many sites around the country. And so even if, and many of those trials weren't always randomized, so they would just iterate. So they would say, we're doing regimen 12 versus last year was regimen 11, but they would do them in a regimented way. And they'd say, okay, now survival is 92%. And the last trial we did, it was 82%. Um, I actually think most of those trials weren't randomized, but they were sort of iterative and they built on each other. The second is that, you know, the kids tolerate aggressive dose escalation, right? So they've learned, I think, a lot in children about when disease is not responding, you push. And when disease is responding, they can back off. So they've gotten really good at sort of tailoring intensification to the dynamics of the disease. And I think, you know, so kids tolerate more. But also they worry, if, for example, giving a lot of chemo and radiation to kids who are developing, you don't want to give any more than you need to. So they'll like follow, did the leukemia regress within a day, a week, a month? And if the leukemia is melting away, they start to actually back off. Whereas in the people where the leukemias are sluggishly responding, they go all in. And I think that one, they the strategy is really thoughtful and elegant. And two, the protoplasm of kids is really good. But most of the trials weren't randomized. By contrast, in, in acute leukemias in the adults, with the caveat of 80% of adult cancer patients aren't on trial. In leukemia, for the people that go on trials, we've done a pretty good job of doing randomized trials. And there have even been a few of recent, even in adult ALL, where we've seen um, 
randomized trials showing, you know, really great outcomes, um, you often borrowing the regimens from kids. Do you think that that same iterative process that was used in pediatric patients could be successful in an adult setting, or is there some reason why that would be difficult to implement? Um, I think that on some level it's it's used. I think it could always be used more. I do think that um, in adults, we are more reliant on the randomized trials. So when we iterate, we'll iterate the new regimen versus the last. I think it's just, you know, patient number and volume and how we do things. Um, I, I also think it was a different era. I don't think in the 70s and 80s, there were a lot of randomized trials. And by the time randomized trials started occurring, you know, the outcomes in ALL were so damn good that, you know what I'm saying? In kids. Yeah. All right. Well, we have a few rapid fire questions for you. Yeah. The first one is, what important medical truth do very few of your colleagues agree with you on? I mean, I think, you know, for me, the, the thing that in my area that, that I, I struggle with a lot is that people tend to use a lot of treatments that work up front in the relapse setting. So you'll see people use Veneza in patients who already failed chemotherapy. And I'm like a bit of a zealot on that. I'm like, there's just no good data. And, and I think people sometimes, you know, like wish and hope and do things. And I kind of will push back hard and be like, that's not a regimen where we've ever had any, you know, careful randomized data. I'm also a big believer, you know, that, um, you know, less is more, um, not so much with leukemic therapy, but, you know, whether it's antibiotics or, you know, I think we 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 have to be much more thoughtful and parsimonious with our use of of things that patients need. Um and 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 the less we overtreat them, the more likely they are to get through it. What is one scientific article that you think that physicians outside your field should be aware of? Ooh, um I I really think um, that the sort of genomic um, sort of outcome classification, it's a paper by Moritz Gertzong and Ellie Pep Emanuel. There's two of them, New England Journal of Nature Genetics, where they developed the prognostic algorithm. I think understanding how we can now use genomics as part of the algorithm and decide treatment, you know, it, it lays out sort of the foundation for what we're doing in AML and we hope for many other human diseases. What's something that you believed 5, 10, 15 years ago that you no longer believe to be true? Um, that's a good one. I, I, I mean, I think, well, I, as an old fogey, um, I, I mean, I would say that, you know, I grew up in an era where, you know, we, you know, we didn't have you know, the tools to really figure out how to apply a lot of things, anti-infectives and other things in particular. So almost everything we did was empiric. And I think we're entering an era where, where as the diagnostics for infectious disease and what they're, you know, get better and the data on when to use them and when not to gets better, that a lot of scenarios where I think we were almost over-treating, for example, the use of you know, aggressive treatment dose antifungal therapy, which in AML was ubiquitous 15 years ago. I think we can be, we're much more careful. And, and I think that's a good thing. If you could run right now with unlimited funds, a single RCT, what would you fund? Well, in AML, I would fund like a trial where I, like you basically had, um, four arms. I would say, give me chemo, give me Veneza, and then give me either one of those adding the targeted therapy based on the patient and say, which of those like wins in, in, in AML and are there subsets where one is the better? I would just do, a, to me, that four-way trial is the trial we should do. One big one. 
Thank you so much for joining us on the external medicine podcast. Um, Before we finish the interview, um, where should people find you on the internet if they're interested in learning more about you? My Twitter handle is Ross Levine, MD. Easy to find. Excellent. Thank you so much. This this has been great. Thank you so much, Ross. Absolutely. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. We do not endorse any healthcare providers or treatments. Our views do not represent the views of any official organization or institution. If you'd like to support us, subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review, preferably a phenomenal review. Visit us at externalmedicinepodcast.com and tell your friends. 